This video was brought to you by Curiosity Stream. Sign up now to get our streaming service Nebula absolutely free, where you can watch exclusive TLDR videos and an extended version of our show, The Daily Briefing. This is the topic that's been plaguing British politics for years. And no, it's not Partygate or Brexit. We're talking about Scottish independence. After years of demanding a second referendum on independence, Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, in a statement to the Scottish Parliament earlier this week, announced her plan for a second referendum. A referendum that's set to be held on the 19th of October 2023. The question, though, is whether her plan will work. So in this video, we'll try and answer that and explain just what happens next for Scottish independence. Before we delve into Sturgeon's plan to actually get a referendum, we need to first answer the question why she even needs a plan. She's the leader of Scotland. Couldn't she just hold a referendum? Well, put simply, no. And the issue here is the legality. Now, to understand this properly, we're going to need to explain Scottish devolution. And while this might get complicated for a moment, trust me, it will make explaining Sturgeon's plan and the next steps a hell of a lot easier. Okay, so... Thanks to the Scotland Act of 1998, the Scottish Parliament has a degree of autonomy and self-control over Scottish affairs. Broadly speaking, it can make laws on a whole variety of topics which fall within its legislative competence. Now, there's a lot of things within this competence, but Section 29 of the Scotland Act says that a provision is outside of the Scottish Parliament's legislative competence if it's incompatible with any of the European Convention of Human Rights, would form part of the law for a country or territory other than Scotland, or, most importantly for us, relates to reserved matters. In other words, there's a list of reserved matters in the Scotland Act which the Scottish Parliament cannot legislate on. And, importantly, one of the things on that list is the Union of Kingdoms of Scotland and England. Now, that's clearly important, because an independence referendum would almost certainly relate to the union between Scotland and England, meaning that any prospective referendum would likely fall out of the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament, meaning that if they were to call a referendum on their own, it would be illegitimate and potentially illegal. Hence the need for Sturgeon to have a plan. She can't just call a referendum on her own. Now, you might have noticed during that explanation that I use the words likely and potentially a lot. And that's not just me covering my back. It's something we'll return to in a moment. But for now, let's move on to the actual substance of Sturgeon's plan. Broadly speaking, Sturgeon's plan has three routes for getting to a referendum. Well, two and a half. One route relies on negotiation, one relies on the courts, and a third on the ballot box. And to properly understand whether each route will work, let's take a step back and explain each route in turn. Starting with the first route, the one that relies on negotiation. The negotiation route is in the eyes of many, if not all people, the best route to a potential referendum, and the one that the SNP actually went with back in 2014. Essentially, while Sturgeon can't call a referendum on her own, as the list of reserved matters currently seems to preclude any independence referendum, that list of reserved matters isn't static. Under Article 30 of the Scotland Act, that list can be amended to insert or remove reserved matters using so-called Section 30 orders. This means that if a new order referencing a referendum were granted, then Scotland would suddenly have the power to call a referendum for themselves something which they could hold on the 19th of October 2023. The problem is that a Section 30 order isn't really on the cards. While a Section 30 order can be initiated by either the Scottish or UK government, for it to actually go through, the order needs to be approved by the House of Commons, House of Lords and the Scottish Parliament. And, well, the House of Commons, which is currently ruled by the Conservatives, doesn't look likely to approve any such order. So, with that route effectively closed, let's double back and look at the second route for potentially getting a referendum. Through the courts. When earlier on in this video we kept saying that it was likely a referendum would relate to reserved matters, we were being cautious with our language because it's not entirely clear that a referendum would actually relate to reserved matters. That's because there's ultimately a distinction between purpose and effect. An advisory referendum could be argued to have the purpose of triggering Scottish independence, but not the effect of doing so, which raises the question of how 
relates to is to be interpreted. Different people have argued this case both ways, putting a huge question mark over the legality of Sturgeon holding an advisory, non-binding referendum, even without a Section 30 order. And so, preempting the legal challenge, and with the first route closed for the time being, Sturgeon asked Scotland's Lord Advocate to refer the matter to the Supreme Court, and for them to decide whether or not holding an advisory referendum would be in the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament. If they rule yes, then the route to an advisory referendum next year is now open, with the Supreme Court's consent. Which brings us to where we stand now, it's basically a waiting game to see what the Supreme Court says. However, the problem for Sturgeon is that if the Supreme Court rules that the referendum would not be within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament, then we've hit another dead end. In her speech to the Scottish Parliament, Sturgeon remarked that if this were to happen... Any notion of the UK as a voluntary union of nations is a fiction. Any suggestion that the UK is a partnership of equals is false. Instead, we will be confronted with this reality. No matter how Scotland votes, regardless of what future we desire for our country, Westminster can block and overrule. Westminster will always have the final say. Regardless of your feelings on the matter, though, this would leave Route 2 closed, leaving us with just Route 3, a referendum through the ballot box. That's because if a Section 30 order isn't granted and the Supreme Court rules against her, Sturgeon announced that the SNP would fight the next UK general election on a single question. Should Scotland be an independent country? In effect, she wants to turn the next general election into a de facto referendum. And if the SNP won in Scotland as a pure single-issue party, they could claim that there's a clear appetite for independence. The problem here is that this route isn't really a route per se. Unlike a referendum, and a referendum under legislative competence, a general election, for some, doesn't hold the same legitimacy, and therefore wouldn't be sufficient grounds for Scottish independence, even if the SNP did formally become a single-issue party. And this would just be a huge political gamble for both Sturgeon and the SNP. While the SNP have won every election in Scotland since 2007, they've only come close to winning an outright majority of votes in 2015, when they garnered 49.97% of the vote. In reality, if they want to convince anyone, the SNP would need to get a clear proportion of the electorate to back them, definitely above 50%, if they want to really argue that they have an established and legitimate mandate to make Scotland independent. And based on their electoral track record, it's not clear they could achieve this. Also, James Mitchell, a professor of public policy at Edinburgh University, has stressed that there's no such thing as a de facto referendum. In a referendum, the question is very clear. That's the whole point of a referendum. It's focused. There isn't the same focus in an election. An election is simply not a referendum, a de facto referendum, or any other kind of referendum. So it seems that this backup plan might not be the best either, leaving Sturgeon fairly out of options when it comes to finding a way for independence. So ultimately, it kind of rests on what the Supreme Court have to say. And regardless, any referendum, be it de facto or legitimate, will be controversial to say the least. And it could just be the start of potentially years of negotiation. So ultimately, it would never be the end of the union, merely the beginning of it. Regardless, this is something Johnson clearly wants to avoid. He just doesn't want to be the Prime Minister who oversaw the dissolution of the Union. In fact, if this were to happen, or even get close to happening, his job could seriously be in peril. So in preparation for that, so in preparation for that, the TLDI UK writing team sat down to debate their personal top five most likely people to take over from Johnson. And the debate got a little heated. That video is available only on Nebula. Well, you'll find a bunch of other exclusive videos, like our full interview with Professor Portes about whether Brexit's really working, and our explainer on which country is actually the smartest in the world. Could it be the UK? Or maybe Scotland? Now, if you're interested in that, then I've got some good news, because we've partnered with CuriosityStream, home of the best documentaries online. 
And thanks to them, you can get both streaming services, CuriosityStream for the documentaries and Nebula for bonus TLDR for less than $15 a year. That's a wild deal and a 26% discount on their already low price. So get yourself a ton of documentaries and exclusive content from your favorite creators, including the Daily Briefing Extended Edition, by signing up using the link below. Thanks for your support.